In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Um, my beloved, it has been a while. It has been uh, a few months now that we haven't done a live Q&A. And I am forced today to do it on my phone because for some reason the application um, on my laptop is not working today. So despite the fact that we're having some technical difficulties, I am actually very excited to be with all of you guys today. Um, so bear with me as I'm using my phone. It's going to be a little bit shaky, but I hope that somehow we still make it work uh, properly. So as you know, on a monthly basis, we try to gather all together. We try to do these live questions and answer sessions so that everyone can benefit. We try to do it in a way so that everyone could participate live through the Facebook application. Um, we've received tons of questions from you guys over the last several months, over the last years. We've been accumulating them. So today, hopefully, what we're going to do is that we're going to invite everyone who's participating with us live to be able to submit their questions live, and we'll go through them as best as we can. And at the same time, uh, if we don't get any questions right Right away at the very least what we'll do then is that we'll pull some of the questions from um, the different sources that we've collected over the years so let's go ahead and break the ice I see that there's a few people who've already joined and uh, now bear with me because I'm using my phone I'm not really sure where I'm supposed to see the comments if they appear but hopefully I'll see them come up on the screen I'll be able to answer them so again I invite anyone who's participating submit your questions and we'll go from there for now I'll go ahead and read off one of the questions that we've received just recently and you guys um, can, in that time, think of different questions that you'd like to submit. So the first question that we have is a question that was submitted by a young man here in Canada. Uh, and the question is as follows. Why does the Coptic Orthodox Church believe in the idea of excommunication? Are we not called to forgive everyone and to be patient with everyone? And what does it actually mean for someone to be excommunicated? So, very good question. In regards to excommunication, I want us to understand that, unfortunately, there's two words that are very often misunderstood that we use almost as if they were synonymous, but in reality, they're not synonymous. The first one is for one someone to be outside of communion, which is excommunicated, and another word is what we use as anathema. Okay. Now, the difference between the both is that Excommunicated is a term that we actually adopt to be able to say that we've asked the person to refrain from the participation of the Eucharist, to be outside of communion, and oftentimes the church will use it as a means of therapy. Now let me clarify. When a person is approached by a clergy member and is told, we want you to refrain from participating in the Eucharist for a period of time, Oftentimes, this is done to be able to send a very clear message and to invite the person to participate in an active life of repentance in order to not take for granted this bread of life, to take for granted the meaning of the Eucharist. Because as we read in St. Paul, we don't want the Eucharist to be a source of condemnation to us. We don't want it to bring on us judgment. On the contrary, we want it to be the bread of life which fills us with life. Now, in which cases a person may be asked to refrain from participation in communion is honestly a very complicated process. Just to be clear, there is no such thing as I've bothered the priest, I've upset him, I've gotten on his bad side, so he's going to go ahead and tell me you're outside of communion. That's not what happens, my beloved. On the contrary, if you've noticed, among the apostolic churches, the Coptic Orthodox Church is one where the faithful participate in the Eucharist on a regular basis, and if not weekly, even multiple times a week. During Lent, we have people who participate on a daily basis. Now, if you compare this to other Oriental Orthodox churches, if you compare this to other apostolic churches, there are some churches where there is a piety that is adopted that we do not necessarily share uh, in regards, our, we don't share our views on them, we don't we don't see eye to eye with them, where people believe that the Eucharist is so holy, so sacred, and I am so unworthy and so sinful that I should not participate with it unless it's the exceptional once or twice a year. On the contrary, within the Coptic Orthodox mindset, we really do believe that a person should be participating as often as possible. Daily, even if you can, and if you have access to that many liturgies a week. So when a person is told to not participate, it's in extreme circumstances. It's in circumstances where the person has clearly demonstrated either a heretic perspective, whether in the praxis of the person, in the practical life and with the way that they act, or in the theology or the things that they teach. So, let me explain what it is that I'm trying to say here. For example, if a person, for instance, with uh, decides that they are in a marriage, for instance, and despite the fact that they are married and they have children, 
They don't pursue divorce. They simply think that it's perfectly okay for them to be in an active relationship with someone else and to be public about it. Now, what do we do in those situations where a person is very clearly rebelling against the covenant that, that they have had at the altar with God in the sacramental crowning? What do we do with the fact that they are supposed to be united to their spouse, but instead they are publicly declaring that I have no interest in fulfilling my role and my responsibility towards this other person? The church invites the person to repentance. The person invites the person to be able to recognize that what they're doing is sinful. That their sin now is not only one that is condemning them, but is also creating a punishment and a consequence on the people that they live with. That they are harming those around them by choosing to live in this sin and to not repent from it. If we allow this person to come into commune, then their participation in the Eucharist is one that can actually bring condemnation on them. And so the therapy that we adopt is to say, leave the Eucharist alone. And we will serve you outside of this reality in order to help you, in order to be able to restore you back to a place where your, accept, your repentance is actually one that is accepted, where you realize that there is something to change about you. Because you see, if the church doesn't adopt this view, then we are leaving the person to remain in their sin, and we are allowing them to participate in the Eucharist as if somehow that there is nothing there to change. And this is where it becomes very scary. And this is where we have to realize that the church only tells a person to refrain from communion in extreme circumstances. Very few people in the history of the Coptic Orthodox Church in the last several decades have ever been formally excommunicated and told, you are outside of communion. You are no longer allowed to come and participate with us. Now, oftentimes that idea of a permanent state of being outside of communion is what a lot of people will call uh, being anathematized. And again, the church has done that very, very seldomly. So to answer the person's question, when the church adopts this perspective of refrain communion for a while, it's an invitation to repentance. It is not some sort of judgment where we say, you've been a naughty boy, we're going to put you in time out. Once you get your thoughts together, come back and participate. That's not the point at all. The point is for us to serve the person. The point is for us to help the person reconcile back to God, to not allow their sin to overtake them and not to create for themselves a state where they are um, being rendered truly unworthy of participating in the Eucharist because they have blasphemed against the laws of God. So hopefully this answers the questions just a little bit. We have received um, a few questions, I believe. No, we just have a few viewers. Welcome, Sandrine, and welcome, Abuna Makarios. Uh, it's a blessing to have you guys. Please, if there's anyone who has any questions or comments, um, feel free to submit them, and we'll go ahead and answer them as quickly as possible. Let me go ahead and pull up just another question that has been submitted. Give me a split second. There is a question regarding what is the church's stance regarding the Eastern Orthodox and what are our hopes for becoming one? So, when we speak about our brothers and sisters in the Eastern Orthodox, or when we speak of our brothers and sisters in the Catholic faith, all the apostolic traditions of the Church, we should know that we all began around the same table. We should know that, to a certain extent, um, when the Church was at its best, if you wish, in the very early Church, everyone was Catholic, and everyone was Orthodox. Because Catholic means nothing more than the universality of the Church, and for us to be able to declare that the church is orthodox and our faith is orthodox, all that means is that our faith is unwavering. Much later on that we have these splits where we called some of us Catholic, some of us Orthodox. And you'll notice that today in the Orthodox liturgy, we don't shy away from using the word Catholic. We pray for the one holy Catholic apostolic Orthodox Church of God. We constantly pray for it. So it's not like we're in so in such a great division where we declare that we are heretics one another. That's, that's not the point at all. The point is not to point the finger and to declare that this person is wrong and this and that person is wrong and that. We recognize that there is a truth, a very beautiful truth that we share with the Eastern Orthodox. And we obviously recognize a lot of that truth also among our brothers and sisters in the Catholic Church. Now, ever since the division, ever since 451, where we disagreed on the things that were presented to us in Chalcedon, and when I say disagreed, this is obviously a very, very... Um, it's a very brief way of talking about something that is far more complicated. For those of you who are looking for a better understanding of what actually happened in Chalcedon, I invite everyone to read uh, Richard Price's minutes on the Council of Chalcedon, uh, which gives you a great insight as to the actual discussions and the exact things that were discussed at that council. I also invite everyone, if you have a time, 
Father Anthony Paul, there is a, um, a lecture of his that was given that is found on YouTube on the Council of Chalcedon, where for about 50 minutes he summarizes it very beautifully. I urge everyone to go ahead and read up on that. And what you're going to realize is that we actually have very similar faiths, if not the exact same faith, but we can declare that today. In 451, unfortunately, things got lost in translations. There was a lot of politics. There was a lot of ugliness uh, that was going around. And unfortunately, the devil got what he wanted and he divided us, regardless of what the reasons were. Today, when we look at our brothers and sisters in the Eastern Orthodox Church, we recognize Christ at their altar. We recognize that Christ is present in their priesthood. We recognize the fact that they are a church that is filled with God's grace. And the same thing applies, obviously, for the Apostolic Church of the Catholic Church. Now, we are not in communion because of the fact that we don't agree on the same definitions right now. That right now, we also have disagreements in regards to our expressions and the saints and the anathemas that have not been lifted. But despite all of these things, these things don't hinder us from realizing that Christ is found in these churches. And we do declare them to be very much Christian churches. And so because of this, there is a love. And I have to tell you that that love is really going to be what is going to fuel potential hope for us being unified. And if we are not united at the level of actually signing the paperwork, we are definitely united in heart. There are many bishops from the Eastern Orthodox who love us and who treat us with a tremendous amount of honor. There's a tremendous amount of Coptic Orthodox bishops as well who welcome them with open arms. If there's an Eastern Orthodox person who needs to commune at a Coptic parish, there are many of our fathers, the bishops, who would invite them and tell them, come and commune at the altar. That The opposite is also true, where if a Coptic person is found in certain areas where they need to commune, there are Eastern Orthodox bishops who tell them you are welcome to come and commune as well. So for all of those reasons, and despite the fact that it's not universal, it's not across the board, we also have extremes on both ends and both families. Where in the Oriental Orthodox Church, we have some people who declare them heretics. We have Eastern Orthodox bishops who declare us heretics. All of these things will fade away. All of these things in the end will not have a power over the fact that the Lord is moving, that the Lord, that the Lord is working in us to be able to hopefully unite one day, and if not at the level of the paperwork, at the very least at the level of the love that we have for one another, and the recognition of Christ at the altar, and Christ in His mysteries in all of these churches. So we pray that there can be union. When it's going to happen, um, we leave that up to the Holy Spirit. All right, so my beloved, uh, I really hope that I'm seeing this right, but it doesn't seem like there's any questions that are coming in. If there are questions, Someone help me and tell me how it is that I can see them, <laughs> because I, I clearly don't see them here. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and let's go ahead and continue with some other questions that we've received over time. So there's another question here that is surrounding the issue of. Oh, hold on. There's a question from Mark. Hello, Father. As I'm sure you are aware, there has recently been some discussion around the use of contemporary Christian Protestant songs in our Orthodox churches. I was just wondering where you stand and why. God bless. Well, Mark, uh, what's been happening and what's been discussed on social media recently um, is unfortunate, to say the least. And, and the reason I say unfortunate is obviously because there's a lot of things that we have seen done um, and we have witnessed on social media things that have been brought to light that are very disheartening. Um, and as far as the conversation regarding Protestant songs, I want to urge everybody to realize that there is a difference between what I choose to listen to in my car, the playlist that I create for myself and that I have vetted and I have made sure that the lyrics are orthodox and that the lyrics are acceptable. There's a difference between what I do in my own private practice, the things that inspire me, and how some people feel that it's okay for us to change the ways of the church, especially within the liturgical setting. So although I'm really not interested in giving my personal opinion, because I know that's what you're asking for, my personal opinion and my stance doesn't matter. It really doesn't, because at the end of the day, it shouldn't matter who believes what. What should matter is what has been handed down to us and how it is that we hold on to it. Now, this is, does this necessarily mean that if we're having a youth group and, and we begin after prayer to say a few praise songs, one of them is from Tazbeha, the other one happens to be from Hillsong, and, and should, should this mean that all of us should get triggered and we should break out into like, this is nonsensical, this is not unorthodox, and we should set the church on fire? No, of course not. I think what a lot of us are missing is discernment. 
what a lot of us are missing is a spirit, yes, of simplicity, but yet a spirit that allows us to be able to discern and to identify. Um, are we actually missing out on the beauty and the wealth of our Orthodox Church? Is there something that can be done that we can appreciate, that we can teach others to be able to appreciate, that can help us uh, hold on to what has been given to us? And at the same time, if we want to introduce something new, then let's go ahead and set out a proper example of how to do that. So in the end, I think, Mark, despite the fact that I haven't really answered your question, I believe what's missing around all of these discussions is a spirit of humility and also a spirit of discernment. Um, I think it's very easy to point the fingers and to say such and such uh, a movement is right, such and such a movement is wrong. Um, but I think we really have to get better at also identifying what are the solutions because um, we're very clearly in a situation right now where the Coptic Orthodox Church has to deal with these things. And while it isn't easy, it is necessary for us to ask some really difficult questions. What is right? What is wrong? What can we allow? And if we allow it, what's the process for allowing it? And so on and so forth. So Mark, forgive me. I know I really haven't uh, gone into great detail in answering your question, but I hope that gives you an idea of where my mindset is and how I think we can probably move forward. My beloved, if there's any other questions that are coming in, please feel free to submit them. We'll take them as they come in. In the meantime, I have a sheet here in front of me with other questions that we will go ahead and answer as they come in. So the other question that we have here is surrounding the Dutra canonical books. The person is asking, why is it that in the Bibles that we have at church, we do not have the Dutra canonical books, also known as the Apocrypha? Uh, are these Bibles that we have incomplete? So, very good question. And the simplified answer to the question is the following. The fact that they are called Dutra Canonical or this, like the, se the scripture of second canon is a demonstration of the fact that there has never been an official understanding of what the church has voted, if you wish, in or out in regards to scripture. Now, let's be clear on this because there's a lot of misconception around the Bible. There's a lot of people who believe that the Bible in the form that we have it today, printed out in this big book with the table of contents in the beginning and all of the Old Testament books and all of the New Testament books and the divisions of the chapters and how they're broken down into verses. That's not the way the Bible was delivered to us. As a matter of fact, the word Biblos, which we use today, if you speak French at all, you'll know that the word library is called Bibliothèque where you have this idea of Bible, this word, this beginning of the word bibliothèque, which actually just means a series of books or a collection of books. So in reality, the Bible is nothing more than a collection of already set books that have been chosen. So it was never compiled in the way that we think of it today. If anything, it was only formally the New Testament at the very least, the 27 books of the New Testament. St. Athanasius, in the 4th century, around the year 350, in one of his festal letters, he writes to his congregation in Alexandria, and he tells them, here are the books that I would want you to read. Over time, those are the books that sticked. That those are the books that people eventually identified as the New Testament. But at what point did we actually see a Bible compiled in the way that it is today? This is much later. And we're talking about 13th, 14th century. And only the very, very, very rich had a Bible that had... Um, all of the Old Testament scripture as well as all of the New Testament because you needed a scribe to spend several years in transcribing it properly and handing it over to you well bound in the form of a book. Usually it would only be found uh, uh, accessible to the clergy. And this is why you had many monks and priests and bishops who had access to scripture whenever they wanted, but the people only heard scripture, had access to it mostly through the liturgy. So because of this, what we're identifying here is that eventually, 16th, 17th century, you end up having the development of the printing press. You also have access to be able to do whatever you want as far as selecting the books that you want to print. And eventually what happens is that within the Protestant Reformation, they start selecting certain books that they believe should be part of Scripture and should not be part of Scripture. And in the process, you end up getting the Bibles that we have today. And the Bibles that we have today, for instance, New King James, uh, or all these new international versions, this life application version, all of these new ones are basically the selection and the translations of people who are paying for the printing. If you notice, when you open your Coptic reader, however, you have books in there that are not found in your printed New King James Bible or your new English translation Bible. And the reason for that is that in the Orthodox canons of Scripture, we accept the Deutra canonical books, whether it be the Book of Maccabees, the Book of Tobit, the Book of Wisdom, the Book of Sirach. All of these books are books of the church. We have commentary on them from the early church, and so we know that they were read. We know that they were accepted. There was nothing wrong with them. However, 
when those who were printing later on in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, they chose to forego those books because they felt like those books represented certain values or certain ideologies that they didn't accept in their realities. Uh, so, for instance, um, if you open an Orthodox study Bible, you will find those. If you open a Catholic Bible, you will find the Dutra canonical books. So, again, all of this to answer and say, the Dutra canonical books that we have in the Bible today are ones that are accepted mostly in the apostolic churches. However, the Bibles that we have floating around that are mostly accessible to people, whether it be the New King James or the New English Translation, the New International Version, those are coming from a Protestant mindset, and that's why we have many of those books, um, which I mentioned very briefly, Maccabees, Tobit, um, the Book of Sirach, the Book of Wisdom, Psalm 151, the reason why those were dropped, there's a variety of different discussions in regards to what it is that they have identified in those writings that they felt should not belong in Scripture. So again, I hope that answers the question of the person uh, who submitted it. Again, my beloved, I'm going to urge everyone, if you have any questions, feel free uh, to send them through and we'll try to answer them as best as we can. There is another question that was submitted just recently. Let me go ahead and pull it up. There's a question that asks, what is the church's view on abortion? Um, so my beloved, if you want to know in a lot greater detail what the church's view on abortion, we actually did a video on this several years back. I urge you, if you have a chance, go to CopticOrthodoxAnswers.org or go to our Facebook page. Um, and if you search out for the videos, you'll actually see um, that we did a full video on that very specific topic. Now... What's interesting is that when we talk about this very specific subject of abortion, it's extremely important for us to understand that while many people are trying to make this discussion a scientific one, and there are others who are trying to make it one that is political by involving a tremendous amount of emotion and talking about the rights of the person, um, um, the person either the, the mother who's having the child or the rights of the, ch of the child who's being aborted, that's not necessarily where the church is having this discussion. If you watch the video, you'll see for yourself, the real discussion is around, do we believe in the sacredness of life? Do we believe that God is the author of life and that he brings life into existence and he wills a person into existence at the moment of conception? And if we believe this to be true, then what do we do from there? And what do, what do we expect the church to have of a stance if we really do believe in the sacredness of life? At the end of the day, what I am aborting, what I am trying to terminate, is very clearly something that is alive. Because if it wasn't alive, I wouldn't have a problem. <laughs> then it, why, why get rid of it? Right? If, it's, if it's not harming me and it's not growing and it's not, to, it's not going to take space in my life and I don't have to give birth to it and I have a responsibility towards it, nobody would care. But the fact that it is alive and growing... The fact that it is going to turn into a human being which is going to cause me to be in a relationship and have accountability towards it and now be responsible for it. These are exactly why we're having these conversations. Now some people are trying to have the discussion regarding when does it become a life? When does it move from simply being uh, some sort of, and forgive me for using this terminology, I, there's some articles that talk about you know, the early stages of um, uh, of of the fetus being nothing more than a parasite, they're just consuming energy uh, from the host, which is very unfortunate that we would describe life in that way. Um, and they try to explain that, no, it's only considered life as per the Constitution as of this time or this date. Those are not the conversations we're interested in at all. The real problem is that we fully are aware of the fact that if we see this pregnancy through, we will have a fully alive human being in the front of us, a person who is created in the image and the likeness of God. Do we want to step in the way of actually ending this life? And we all know that the definition which says that the innocent taking for selfish reasons of another human life is murder. That's a definition that we adopt. The innocent, the taking of an innocent life for selfish reasons is murder. Do we want to participate in this? Now, this doesn't mean that there aren't difficult conversations to have. This doesn't mean that you know how sometimes we have to resort to abortion for one reason or another because of very difficult circumstances where a mother's life is at stake or where a person is incapable uh, of giving birth to this child. There's a lot of very difficult scenarios and the church tries to encourage the Christian person to make the best decisions based on the difficulties that surround them. And sometimes the two options that you have as far as a decision are one that is bad and one that is worse. And so we try to choose the lesser of evils. 
Now, these are very difficult pastoral reasons, but uh, very difficult pastoral situations. But let's be very, very honest, my brothers and sisters. We're talking about 1% of the situations here. I, I think the actual statistic was only 1.6% of all abortions in Canada. I'm not sure about the U.S. But 1.6% of all abortions in Canada, this is a statistic that dates back to 2015, only 1.6% of them are because of incest or rape. So what do we do with the other 98%? What do we do? Those are the real discussions that we have to have. But I urge you, if you want to know more about the subject, there's a great video that was recorded, um, and hopefully it gives you a better answer. God bless the person who asked the question. There's a question from Nat Nayel that says, Hello, Father, I would like to ask about a relationship between the Eucharist and theosis, and baptism and theosis. Thank you. On that nail, that's, this, is, this is a wonderful, wonderful question. And obviously, here when you speak of theosis, just so everybody can understand, the way that the Coptic Orthodox Church understands this is our unity with Christ, our participation in the life of Christ, right? And so, if we're going to talk about this process of deification, we, when we participate in the life of Christ, or as St. Peter says it, um, when we partake of the divine nature, we understand this as us never becoming what God is in essence, but on the contrary, that through His grace, He allows us to participate in all that He is. So this is gifted to us. We don't become who He is. We always remain the creature. We always remain something completely foreign to the essence of God. But he, yet He allows us to participate in that life. Um, and oftentimes, the church fathers will talk about this idea of growing in the likeness of God. Now, participating in this likeness is exactly the purpose of the Christian life, for us to fulfill the image of God that we have and to constantly grow more and more into the likeness of His Son. So the way you ask the question, Netanel, is actually very important because what is the relationship between baptism and the Eucharist and deification or theosis? Well, it's very simple. In baptism, I am adopted into the life of Christ. I go from darkness into light. I move from death into life. And all of those prayers are very, very evident in the liturgy of the baptism. If ever you have a chance to read them, we talk about how it is that a person, literally, there is a transfer that happens. The person goes from this state of death to this state of life. This person is adopted into the life of God. He becomes a member of the family of the Holy Trinity. Now, this is absolutely essential because I can never participate in the life of Christ. I can never participate in growing in the likeness of God and share in His life unless I am first His. And what does the Eucharist do? Well, at the end of the Eucharistic prayer of the Divine Liturgy of St. Basil, the Coptic Orthodox rite has the priest repeat the words and say, Amen, Amen, Amen. I believe, I believe, I believe, and I confess to the last breath that this is the life-giving flesh of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who took it from the Holy Virgin Mary, who testified before Pontius Pilate, and we continue on on that manner. But we use the words, this is the life-giving flesh. And yet at the same time, Scripture teaches us that He is life. You see, if we really believe in who He is, if we believe that He is this bread of life, who has come to give life to the world, then my participation in the Eucharist is what fuels my capability of being able to actually participate in the life of God. And this is theosis, isn't it? When I participate in the Eucharist, when He allows me to participate in His life, then this would require for me to take in all that He is, for me to eat this life-giving flesh, for me to eat His body, to drink His blood. And all of these things can only happen if I am baptized. So you see, we've come full circle. He takes me into His family. He allows me to participate in the life-giving flesh and his, uh, and his precious blood. And in the process of doing this, He grants me life. He fuels my energy. He directs me towards Him. And this becomes my life, so my life source. If the Eucharist is my life source, and I am growing closer and closer to God, then I will also grow in His likeness. And this is precisely what theosis is. Now, Nail, I really hope that this somehow answers your question. This is obviously a much bigger question um, that requires a lot more explanation, but I hope at least it satisfies um, at least a brief summary of what it is I'm trying to tell you. Mark, we have another question. Uh, thanks for your answer, Father. I would also like to ask you what you believe to be the best way to share our Orthodox our orthodoxy with Protestant Christians, why, uh, who may find certain of our doctrines to be uh, problematic, and who are taught all their life 
that they are wrong. For example, the concepts of tradition, salvation through faith only, the veneration of the Holy Virgin Mother. Thanks again. Okay, so Mark Habibi, you see, the thing is about orthodoxy, which is very different from other Christian expressions um, of what the faith is, is that within orthodoxy, a lot of what we believe is mystery. And this is where it's, uh, it's very difficult to try to speak to someone who only wants rational and scientific and empirical answers. The honest to God truth is that I believe that if we can first get the person to agree that the church in its truest state can be traced back to Christ and his apostles, if we can do this, if we can have the person realize that the church was at its strongest when it was handed over by Christ to his apostles, and if we can agree to that, then let's go back and take a look at what the church looked like back then. And if we evaluate what the church looked like in the first and second century, if we evaluate what the church looked like in the time of persecution in the first three centuries, if we evaluate what the church looked like after the edict um, that Constantine the Great did, and he allowed Christians to be able to worship freely, and we ask ourselves, what did the church look like then? We're going to find ourselves evaluating 400 years of what the early church did. And if we can evaluate the first 400 years, we'll have a very good idea of what the church actually thought of how the church taught, of how it worked, of how it dealt with all of these issues that, believe me, were facing the same stuff that they still faced, maybe just camouflaged or packaged differently. But at the end of the day, we're undergoing warfare that they underwent as well. If we can allow the person in the front of us to ask those questions, what did the early church look like? How did the people who were discipled by Christ establish that ministry? If we can ask those questions and we trace it all the way back to the very beginning, we can then take a look at the models that exist today and say, which of these is closest to it? Did they believe in intercession back then? Did they believe in the Eucharist back then? Did they feel the need for baptism back then? What was their understanding of Scripture back then? If we ask those questions, then we can take that and use it as the benchmark of the different models that are offered today. And once we benchmark the different models, we then have a responsibility to ask the question, which one is closest to the early church? Which one is closest to that beautiful standard that was set by Christ and his apostles? If we can do that, then I think that's, that becomes the foundation by which we can begin the discussions of those things. We are not doing things because we have invented a certain way and we believe that we're more right than others. We really are trying to remain faithful to what was handed down to us. Now, if St. Paul himself talks about the importance of holding on to the traditions that he handed down, and this is a person who lived at the same time of the apostles, and this is a person who, who, who might have actually seen and witnessed Christ himself preach. Then why would we question that that is not that statement that we also have to do today? So I think, Mark, what we can do is at the very least invite them to ask those questions and maybe give them the resources to be able to investigate it for themselves, and that can lead into a much more fruitful discussion. I hope that helps, Habib. Um, Mary is asking a question. Sorry, I'm not sure if today you are discussing a certain topic or not, but my question is, how do we return to God when you have absolutely no power to do so with all of the frustration and negativity, the frustration and negativity that surrounds our lives, especially if in desperation you screamed and God did not interfere? Mary, I think you're expressing something that so many people uh, are suffering with this idea of you know how do i make my way back to god when there's a little bit of resentment when there's anger when there's frustration and i have to tell you that i think it's a normal thing in the life of every christian to undergo what it is that you're describing like in any other relationship that we have with those that we love there are moments where i question myself in the relationship i question the other person that's in the relationship I wonder whether I'm not being, uh, I'm being valued properly, if I'm being heard, and so on and so forth. The truth of the matter, though, is the relationship that I have and that I share with the Lord Christ and the Holy Spirit and God the Father, the relationship that I have with God is very different in the sense where God is not like my father or my mother or my spouse or my son or my daughter or my brother. He's not like my friends. He doesn't waver. He doesn't change. If I really believe in the statement that God is love, then I have to believe that He's constantly loving. If I believe that God is compassionate, then I have to know that He doesn't change. He's not 
one day compassionate, the other day he's angry at me, he's wrathful one day and the other day he's very forgiving. That's not the way that God deals with us. And I have to be reminded of those things. You see, Mary, what helps me when I am undergoing those phases, those states of mind that you're describing, is for me to remind myself of who it is that I'm dealing with. And oftentimes what it leads me to realize is that the one person who might have changed in the relationship is not God. Something must have happened for me to change. Maybe it's a change of perspective. Maybe it's a circumstance that forced me to take a step back. Maybe it's simply me going through a rough patch and I need to get over it. But I have to remind myself that in the relationship that I have with God, it's not Him who changes. It's me. And the real question is, what do I do about those changes that I'm undergoing? The real question is, what do I do with the fact that as I am undergoing these changes, is it possible that there's something that on my end I have to correct? And sometimes you have to ask the question, what is the expectation that I have towards um, the expectations that I have towards God? Is my expectation simply that God is nothing more than the genie in the lamp where when I ask him for something, if I feel like it is worthy, then he has to change it? Um, so for instance, if I believe that I'm asking for something that is righteous, if I, if I believe that I'm asking for something that fulfill God's will, if I'm asking for God's blessing, then I might think to myself, then why would he not give me that? It, it clearly fits into his will, it, fills in, it fits into his model. And so I get angry at God for not granting me what it is that I asked him to do. Or sometimes I might ask myself, you know, as a father, if I see my child suffering, I would immediately interfere. So why, God, why doesn't God interfere when I'm suffering? What I forget is that God in His infinite glory, He is capable of knowing today, yesterday, and tomorrow. He knows how the, in the fulfillment of things, the things will work out for, in good for those who love Him. He's fully aware of why it is that He is allowing me to undergo this temporary suffering. He's fully aware of why my circumstances, maybe according to me, are so dark, and why He's allowing that even for a moment. I have to trust in the fact that it's not God who's changing. It is me who has to undergo the change in order for me to be able to go closer and closer in adopting His mindset. So Mary, as you ask that question, I understand how frustrating and troubling it can sometimes be. But we have to remind ourselves of who it is that we're dealing with. A loving God who did not consider it robbery for Him to condescend and take on the form of a bondservant. A God who did not leave us in our sin, who while we were still sinners, He chose to become like one of us, to speak to us and to love us. If I remind myself of that, I think I'll be able to return to Him and ask Him the hard hitting questions of where were you and what do you want me to do? I hope that answers your questions, Mary. Natanael asks and says, thank you for your answer, Father, and we'll expect more videos about it. Thank you again. God bless you, Natanael Habib. We have another question, and this will probably be the last question that we're going to answer for today, guys, which says, Hi, Father, I have, I have a complicated question. I mean, at least for me, uh, I start to live with a girl, and we are planning to get married in two years because of our financials. But while we are not officially married... How can we have Holy Communion? Well, Habibi, I think this is a question definitely that you should be asking um, your spiritual father. I want you to reach out to um, one of the local fathers in the parishes around you and to discuss your situation. If there is a situation that you are living in that is exceptional, it will be de de dealt with as at the level of the exception. However, if the situation that you're in right now requires correction, only a father who sits with you and hears your story and understands what you're going through will be able to explain to you what the next steps have to be. Now, again, the church is not interested in simply putting out a legal method where everybody falls into a box in one way or another. We are very interested in meeting the people where they are and helping them to be able to get to God. So again, the only way for that to happen is for you to actually start, at the very least, having a relationship with a spiritual guide who can sit with you, understand your circumstances, and guide you accordingly. And again, I reassure you, if your situation truly is as exceptional as you say it is, then I'm sure that God will give the wisdom to that Father to be able to guide you accordingly. And if your situation simply needs correction, and if it's a situation that can benefit from the guidance of the spiritual Father, and that will eventually lead you to taking Holy Communion, then maybe that's also what you need. So I urge you, please reach out to a local father, speak to someone that you know and trust, a father who will be able to guide you and to help you, and I'm pretty sure things will work out in the end. God bless you, my beloved, and thank you guys for all the questions that have been submitted and for enduring the, the shaky phone, and I'm, forgive me for the, the difficulties with technology. It doesn't always work out in my best interest. Uh, again, we remind all of you 
Um, if there's any of the content that you see in the project, whether it be the words of wisdom, inspirational videos that we put out, the apostolic answers, or the new series that we've recently launched that we're so excited about. Father Gabriel has uh, started a new series called Deep Dive, where right now we're studying the Gospel of St. John uh, in a great amount of depth. If any of those things are of interest to, to you, and if you feel like anybody can benefit from it, please share the content. Uh, please invite others to be able to benefit from it. And we are super encouraged by all the comments that we've been receiving from you guys. Please keep us in your prayers. And I look forward to seeing you guys next month for the next Q&A. God bless you and to God be all glory now and forever and to the ages of all ages. Amen.